want an invitation. to be invited. How do you dress? No new dandan required. We will be dressed in the garment of righteousness. Would you need an RSVP? Oh, no, no, no. Absolutely not. Marriage arranged? We're not accustomed to that. So I won't have a choice? Oh, yes. But this is different. Keep listening on our pastor will explain. And our subject for today is marriage arrange. The bridegroom waits. Say it with me. Marriage arrange. The bridegroom waits. Revelation chapter 19. Father, bless our hearts today and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. After these things, John said, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. That's what verse 1 of chapter 19. But then we go to verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God, the all omnipotent, all-powerful one, he reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And the ten verses, And I fell at his feet, John says, to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of God. Prophecy, marriage arrange, the bridegroom waits. You see, the Old Testament portrays Israel as the bride of the Lord, Isaiah 54, 5 through 6, Hosea 2, 19. Jesus in Mark chapter 2, 19 clearly indicates that he is the bridegroom. In John chapter 3, verse 29, John identifies Jesus as the bridegroom, while he himself, that's John, was only a friend. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2, as well as Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 27, emphasized strongly that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. John in the Revelation, if you notice, he hears the announcement that at last the wedding festivities are to take place. The importance of this announcement and the certainty of his fulfillment are underscored by the angel who said these words in chapter 19 and verse 9. These are the true sayings of God. Say it with me. These are the true sayings of God. In other words, hear this. 
There's a marriage that has been arranged by the bridegroom. Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride of Christ. And that is why someday, as Christians, as blood-washed people of Christ, we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Let's, my first point, planned time of grand celebration. Planned time of grand celebration. Look at verses 6 and 7 again. I heard, as it were, the voice of great multitude. You know, last week, we spoke about the fact there will be rejoicing in heaven. Who has ever seen a wedding that the groom and bride, they aren't happy? If you go to such a wedding, then walk out. You cannot have a wedding where bride and groom, they're not happy. As a matter of fact, when you look around and see all the guests, it's time to celebrate. Marriage is always a wonderful moment. And for those of you who have not gotten married, be jealous. But hear this. Be jealous of the fact that even though you might not celebrate here on earth a wedding, thank God there's going to be a marriage in the air. That is why as Christians, you don't have to worry. John said, listen to what he said in verse 7. Let us be glad and let us rejoice and give honor to Christ for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself what? Ready. The marriage of the Lamb has come, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, if you notice, the Apostle Paul was very clear as to what that marriage will be. His bride has made him herself ready, according to Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. And if we go back to, to 2 Corinthians 11 verse so far, I am jealous over you. This is what Paul says. With God the jealousy. For I have exposed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You know what Paul is saying? You are saved by the blood of Christ. You are now being exposed to Christ. You are now Christians. And someday... We all shall celebrate in that great wonderland. What a day is going to be when we see Jesus. I'm going to present you as a chaste virgin. Wonderful, unspotted, beautiful. What a day is going to be. What a marriage it's going to be. The bride has made herself what? Ready. Who is the bride? The church. That is why every day, as Christians, we need to make ourselves ready. Listen to what Paul says in chapter 5, 31 through 32. In verse 30, uh, 31 to 32, if you know this, he's speaking about husbands and their wives and that relationship. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall become what? One flesh. Then verse 32 said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Just as a young man will take up his bride, a young lady becomes his bride, then the Apostle Paul is simply saying, this is a great mystery. As concerning Christ and the church, when God saves us, we become a part of that great fellowship hall so that we'll meet the Lord in the air and we shall be married to the groom. You know why we're going to be married to Jesus? Because we have made ourselves ready. You have kept yourself. You have walked close to him. You have served him for years. You have walked in the light of God's word. And then God is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Those who live for Christ, you have nothing to regret. Those who walk in the light, 
as crisis in the life, you have all to rejoice about. You know why? Because your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The bride, all of God's redeemed, we believe they are his bride. They now will be escorted into heaven. This marriage will play, take place not on earth, but this marriage will take place where? In heaven. It will take place after the tri tri tribulation, immediately after the judgment seat of Christ, and then just before the millennial reign of Christ, according to Ephesians 5 and verse 27. Just before the one, the millenn when I say millennial reign, 1,000 year reign. This is what Paul says, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without what blemish, so will be in the presence of Almighty God. But could you imagine that indeed as the bride, we made ourselves ready so that we'll meet the Lord in the air. I want to say the preparation for readiness by the bride. What's the preparation? In verse 8 it tells us, And to her was granted that should be, the, she should be arrayed in what? Fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Down here on earth, bride, they, get to, they go to the best dressmaker. As a matter of fact, some of them, they go to some stores. They get their dresses all the way. Some get from London. Some get from New York. Some get from Toronto. But there's no bride that will match the real church of Jesus Christ when we find ourselves in the presence of Almighty God. The wedding garment, the Bible says, will be fine linen, defined as the righteousness of saints. In other words, praise the Lord. You only hear that when you get to heaven. The fine linen will be the righteousness of saints. That righteousness has been imputed by the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I cannot make ourselves righteous. God makes us righteous. Before I came to Christ, I was a sinner. But thank God for his grace and mercy. Had it not been for God's grace and mercy, I would not have been preaching to you today. That is why I don't go around boasting that I'm the best Christian. I don't do it. I don't go around pre boasting, oh, I'm the best preacher. I'm the worst. I don't go around boasting and say, I can do this and I can do that. I don't care about it. What I care about is that someday I shall be in that number when the saints go marching in. What a gathering, what a meeting. It's going to be in the air when the church of Jesus Christ, we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And Paul says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Give God a praise because he's worthy. The bride hath made herself what? Ready. Righteousness being imputed. When God makes you righteous, you're righteous. If a person comes to you and says, boy, you're a holy boy, you might be a devil on the inside. And you know, sometimes the church, we see people and say, boy, this one is so holy. And that's all not so unholy. But in the final analysis, only when we stand before God, that the real person is going to be known. The Bible says the church hath made herself what? Ready. And that is why I call upon every person here today. Be ready for that trumpet. Be ready for that marriage feast. Be ready for that moment when the church of Jesus Christ shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. I'm looking forward to being that number. You know, I say I preach to people if they don't want to find their way is up to you. That is why I preach the undiluted word of God. I preach to people not some nice little nice things they want to hear. Not some prosperity gospel. But I preach the gospel so people can repent. They can know that man is a sinner. And that he needs God. He needs to repent. And he needs to come to the cross. And when you come to the cross. That's when Christ will forgive you of all your sins. And then you can say my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So imputed righteousness, righteous acts, 
will be judged by Almighty God. You know, in, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul is speaking to Brother Titus, who was one of his young pastors. And he said to Titus, God will reward us for our faithful work. Listen to what he says. This is a faithful saying. And these things will I, that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all men. When you become a Christian, then you start to do good works. Hear this. Unsaved cannot work for salvation. The unsaved cannot work for salvation. It's when you come to Christ. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 10 says, tell us very clearly, not of works, for by grace you have been saved. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. And that is why it's by God's grace that we're here today. And if you're here because of your good looks, something wrong. And if you're here because of your education ability, something wrong. Well, I want to tell you, listen, we're here because of God's grace and God's mercy. And none of us knows what's going to happen tomorrow. None of us know. We are told that on the Atlantic side of the ocean and coming our area, there are disturbed weather. But our meteorologists, they, don't, they aren't certain which island is going to be hit. But you know, they can make all, we can make all the plans. But God has a way of speaking. When we were in church last Sunday, many of you didn't realize we had two tremors, one or two. But we were right in church. But we didn't realize it. So I said, the Lord can come. You will realize that he has come because the righteous will be going. You might be in a service like this and the trumpet sound. The pulpit is going to be empty. I'm going to assure you that. I'm going up. But we want to see all the brethren as well. Amen? Shall what be what? Tell me that. All the money you have in the bank. You won't be able to check it tomorrow when the Lord comes. That is why you better make sure you give what belongs to the church. That nice vehicle you have, you won't be able to drive it again. That nice house that you build with all the nice rooms. You see all these things, they are just for down here. They are just for a time. After you have labored, after all these things. Listen, man, you got to die and leave them. I've watched persons who have had wealth on earth. And I've watched some of them, they have gone. You know, it used to be my little friend, um, Strafi. You know, when she died, I remember. And I used to do a lot of funeral with her. And she would say to me, Pastor, it's amazing what people would do when their loved ones depart. Some of them, the things that they would bring, the things that they would do, the things that they would do. And you talk to other funeral homes, and they tell you the same thing. People do it because they figure somehow they will cushion something. They will make the burden lighter. But I want to say here, listen, when a person dies, if he doesn't know Christ now, there's nothing you can do when the person dies. You want me to say it again? It's not something people want to hear, but I know they are their loved ones. I have loved ones who died. My mother died. My dad died. I have brother died. I have to bury them all. The hardest thing is to bury your mom, bury your dad, bury your brother. Two brothers I buried. Fellow ministers, they have asked me, they said, can how you do it? How can you bury your mother? I said it was tough. But the thing I knew was the fact that they are children of God. And that brought satisfaction to me. I could not go to the funeral and say, well, such and such. So about my niece who died just about a year and something and a half in, um, while she was at university doing her PhD. And she passed away young in her 20s. Right. I had to take part in that service at an Adventist church. Right there in New York. Or in Florida. Not New York, but Florida. And I had to take part in the service. And I look at her in that casket. Young lady, my heart broke. 
I look at my brother, that's the dad. And I watch as the tears came rolling down. And I went and put my arm around him. And I said, Jesus knows all about our struggles. There are times that you don't even know what to do, what to say. And especially when, listen, it's your, perhaps your children, when it's your mother, when it's a loved one. But I tell you, someday, if they only be faithful and true, we shall meet our Lord in the air. Thank God we can know Christ as Lord and Savior. I want to appeal to you today. I know we come to church and we love your church and I love you all. But I know that's not enough. You have to make a commitment. I want to follow Christ. I want to die being a child of God. And that is so uncertain. And sometimes you think people are in their 60s and 70s and 80s. You see someone is still alive? Mr. Brown is in her 90s. Other members of this church have visited there in their 90s. One member for a church, almost 100. And I said to myself, listen, the young ones are dying. Sometimes they just reach in their 50s, 40s, but the young, 50s. They cannot make it. But I want to say, the Lord is coming back soon. God will reward faithfulness as well as fruitfulness. Say it with me. God will reward faithfulness as well as fruitfulness. In chapter 19 of the book of Luke, 11 through 27, I'm not going to read the chapter. I'm just going to explain it. That's in Luke chapter 19, 11 through 27. It has to do with the parable of the powers. And the Bible speaks about this nobleman who went into a far country. And he shared his goods. And he told his servants, go and get interest. Go and multiply. Give them a certain amount of money. In that parable, we notice he speaks about qualitative as well as quantitative I mean, elements in our Christian service. The servants given certain amount of pounds to invest. Two of the three servants invested and gained tremendous interest, if you know this. The one, the unfaithful servant, did nothing with the money. As a matter of fact, he termed the master. He said, you're a wicked. He said, you're, you're hard, you're austere. But this, the, the master turned around and said, you are a wicked servant. Chapter 20, 19, 22. But to the faithful servants, if you notice, he said to both of them, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Verse 17 of chapter 19. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. In other words, those who were able to invest their talent do. Listen, listen, Mitchell, and I want to say here, all of us, God has given us tremendous talents. Invest it for kingdom building. Invest it for God. When you do the great things for God, God will honor you. God will bless you. Payday is coming. The nobleman returned. One of the servants said, you are a hard man. You are austere. You don't deserve to be your leader. But the master said, all I ask you to do is to go and invest for me. And he brought back the money and said, listen, I got nothing on it. I didn't do nothing. When you're a child of God, do you just do nothing? Hear me. Be a fat Christian for Christ. Say it with me. Be a fat servant for Christ. I'm not talking about obesity, bodily mass. I'm not talking about that. Be faithful. Be available and be teachable. Let me say it again. Be faithful. Be available and be teachable. Be a fat servant for Almighty God. God wants us to make ourselves available. Win other people to Jesus Christ. You cannot be a Christian. 
you know, this church should be packed. We have enough people who can fill it. If each one win one, I guarantee you, try it next Sunday. You're here, bring someone with you. And I tell you, this church would not hold them. And if we continue to multiply, then it's no problem. The board will be glad to knock out the walls. Amen. Wouldn't it be a great thing that you have to come early just to find a seat in church? When I was growing up, you didn't go early. Brother, sometimes you stand outside. So many people used to go to church. What happened? People ignore the church today. But we all need the Lord. There's going to be a marriage in the air. Now, after that marriage in, the, in heaven, this is what's going to take place in heaven. And after that marriage in heaven, there will be position given because now you'll enter into the millennium. 1,000 year reign. I usually put it like this, 1,000 years of honeymoon. 1,000 years. Listen what will happen. In that new city, God will, listen, transfer from heaven and he will come and set it up on earth. Beautiful earth. A reformed earth. A new heaven and a new earth, John saw. And listen what will happen. The Bible says for 1,000 years, we will be given leadership position in that new city. Believers will be rewarded according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, 11 through 12. In, that, in those verses, Paul says to us that once you're a child of God, we are going to be rewarded. Sometimes you think you work down here and no one sees what you're doing. But God sees and he takes record. Only Jesus, who is God, is worthy of worship. In verse 10, John said, when he saw everything, then he bowed down and he started to worship. The angel said to him, John, don't worship me. Look at verse 10. That's what he says. Do not worship me. I am just your fellow servant. In other words, only God deserves our worship. That is why when we come together as brethren, I want to encourage you today, just close your eyes sometimes and worship God. Just give him praise. Just give him honor. Sometimes you stand in your kitchen and you just give God thanks for providing for you. Sometimes you just look at your children. I tell you, God has been good. Sometimes when you look, man, you have worked so hard to see your children through school. And when you realize that God has been good, they have made something out of their lives. Brothers and sisters, wave your hand and give God praise and glory and honor. And say, God, you have been good. Look at how you have blessed my children. Look Look at how you have provided for, for us. Look at how you have worked things out. God has been good. Worship him, adore him, and thank him for all his blessings upon your life. John said, I got fell down and I start to worship too. One of the things that will happen in heaven, listen, they're going to be rejoicing. You know, here on earth, or rejoicing is temporary. Sometimes it's in the flesh. But when we get to heaven, it will be a spiritual one. Where the blood-washed church of Jesus Christ, realizing that you're home at last, after the perils, after the rough path, after you have sweated it out on earth, after you have gone through all the trials, after you have gone through all the hurts, after you have gone through all the pain, finally, you're in the presence of God. And God says, welcome home, my child. I'm going to reward you. In closing, there will be eternal crowns being set aside for God's servants. Listen at them and I close on it. The Bible speaks about first, in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. You can write it down when you go home. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Speaks of the imperishable crown. The imperishable crown. Paul told you, the Corinthians, those who victoriously run the race of life, they shall receive what you call the imperishable crown. You have been faithful, victorious, so you have won, run the race. In our Sunday school class this morning, 
uh, Minister Ling beautifully explained about the Olympics and how persons that, you know, and I'm sorry for some of the competitors, and especially if you don't know how to hold the baton. And someone makes sure that they brought it out. Okay, that team, they know it. I know why they said it. Because that's my team. And they dropped the baton. But the point I'm making, there are those who what? Who ran successfully. But only one receive a gold medal. There are three medals you can get. You either can get gold, silver, or bronze. Everyone wants gold. But when you're a child of God, we can all receive gold. That imperishable crown lasts forever and forever. Only one winner in all competition. Only one person going to win. But when you're a child of God, we are all winners. Give God praise. Then the Bible speaks about the second crown. The crown of exaltation. Philippians 4 and verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 19 to 20. The crown of exaltation. You know what that crown is? We call it the soul winner's crown. Every person can win somebody for Jesus. And that is why when you get to heaven, take someone with you. You have to be selfish to go to heaven and not take someone with you. If you have a brother not a Christian, pray that God will change that life. If you have a sister, she's not saved, pray that God will change and save that person. If your dad, if your mom not a Christian, pray for that person. If your children aren't saved, you need to take them with you. And the church say, then the third crown that will happen will be the crown of righteousness. Second Timothy chapter 4, 7 through 8. Second Timothy 4, 7 through 8, the crown of righteousness. What's the crown of righteousness? For those who live daily with eternity in mind. Every day as Christians, we live with eternity in mind. You know, sometimes I, you know, you'll have even Christians who said, well, everything you talk about, the Lord is coming back. Everything you say, the Lord is coming Listen, it's a doctrinal fact. It's biblically sound. It's hermeneutically sound. That is why speak about it. That's what the Bible says. The Lord is coming back. And that is why every Christian, every day you should say, you look with expectation. The Lord is coming back. Daily with eternity in mind. That's how we ought to live. Every day because your life can be snatched out. Then the fourth crown. The crown of life. James 1 verse 12. What's the crown of life? For those who suffered during their earthly life. Let's say those who have suffered for Christ. If you suffer because you stole the man money, you need to go to jail. If you're suffering because you have caused a problem on the job, then you need. But some people suffered only because they are Christians. Some of you suffered only because you have made public stand for God. Some of you suffered only because you say you're not going to get involved in that fraudulent act. And you people, they, ex they excommunicate you. They figure you don't belong here. I want you to keep suffering for God. Someday, payday is coming. And the Lord will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. As a Christian, you have to make many stand for God. It's not easy. But stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. And once you're a child of God, make your stand resolute and let the world know whose side that you're on. If you're on the Lord's side, rejoice today and say, someday, someday I'm going to receive my crown of rejoicing. Praise God. What a crown of life. Suffer down here. Many have been martyred was Polycarp who said when they asked him to recant, 
He said, how can I give up God? He has been good for me, to me for 80 and 6 years. How can I give him up now? He held on to God. He said, do what you want to do with me. But as for me, I'm going to serve God. I think I hear Joshua said, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. Choose ye this day. Choose ye this day. You have to make a stand. Moses stood up. Moses said, I'd rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I'd rather suffer for Christ than to die enjoying things on earth but die being a pauper. The crown of life for those who suffered. Then the last crown I'll highlight you is the crown of glory. The crown of glory. First Peter chapter 5 1 through 4. What's the crown of glory? For those on the shepherds who faithfully serve. You hear the crown? The crown of glory. For those pastors on the shepherds who faithfully serve. Being a pastor today is not the easiest thing. It's not easy to deal with people. People just say it to you because... You look different from them. They hate you because you behave what? Different from them. They behave certain way because you're not going to associate what they're doing. And you're not going to give approval to such. And there are some people, they just take it out. Some come to church, I don't want to see that pastor. But here I tell you, listen, there's a crown awaiting for those who faithfully serve. Amen. And you might say, Pastor Sharp, I'm not a pastor. What about me? Your crown is sure. When you stand up for God, God will reward you at the end of the journey. 